Now, for your information, a couple of things. Some of you ladies that say, that old boy looks pretty, a little rough around the edges there. <laughs> Remember this. The man appointed by God Almighty to pave the way for Jesus, his son, his name was John the Baptist. He looked a lot rougher than I do right now. I have on my very best clothes, <laughs> literally, <laughs> that I own. I never bought a watch, as in a watch, uh, nor a suit, nor a cell phone. And my family told me one time, Dad, we're going to have to purchase a computer. I said, y'all buy the thing and do whatever you do with it. I've never actually turned it on or looked at it. Now, some of you are thinking, you never owned a watch. How in the world you tell time? It's just about dark now. <laughs> That's what time it is. We wait a while. It'll be on up into the night. Then the dead of night, the wee hours of the morning. Just for daylight, sun up, mid-morning, sundown. Are you with me here? It leads for a lot less stressful life. Someone says, but you don't understand, Robertson, what you've missed, what you're missing. But I do know. See, I know what I'm missing. You understand what I'm saying? I know exactly what I'm missing. But to each his own. As you can see, I know I look like a preacher. <laughs> I'm not an ordained preacher. Nope. Neither was John the Baptist. The preacher in the sense you're thinking of, no. Messenger, I am. Ordained by men, no. It takes a lot of different kinds to make up the kingdom of God. Rich, poor, white, black, red, yellow, all types. If you want to be a world champion duck caller, this is basically what you're going to have to do. Unfortunately, I've never heard a duck do that. <laughs> so they told me about 35 years ago, they said, listen, if you want to be to sell duck calls in America, Mr. Robinson, you're going to have to learn and win the World Championship Duck Call Contest over at Stuttgart. I said, well, show me what they do. And this cat, you know, he got in a stance and his eyes rolled back in his head. <laughs> I'm sitting there listening to him, and I said, uh, could a duck win it? <laughs> he said a duck could not even place in the thing. You know, Mississippi, when a, when, a, when a hen mallard, a mallard duck can't win a mallard duck duck call contest. <laughs> I said, boys, I tell you what, I don't think I'm going. So I've never been to one of those. However... You're looking at about 35 years of work. It's impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. George Washington, first president of the United States. Impossible to govern the world right without God and the Bible. Name the capital of your country after him, is what they all said. Anybody take a stand like that for God in the Bible, let's name our capital after him. Everybody, yeah. While we're at it, let's erect a huge monument in his honor. 
so we'll never forget where he stood. And we did. Bible verses from the bottom all the way to the tip top. That capstone on the Washington Monument says, Praise God. A reporter asked Andrew Jackson, old Hickory, one time, uh, President Jackson, why do you always carry your Bible with you everywhere you go? He picked it up and he said, That book, sir, is the rock the Republic rests on. Hey, Mississippi, I'm still there. I'm in the company of George Washington, Andrew Jackson. I haven't changed a bit. I'm not budging. Your forefathers would not budge. And all my distresses and sorrow, reading the scriptures never fails to give me comfort. Robert E. Lee. Uh, we owe these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. They've been endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable rights, Mississippi. That's rights that God gives you that no government can take away from you. No man can take from you. It's God-given right. Uh, some of these are life. Thomas Jefferson, your third president, writer of the Declaration of Independence, says some things you ought to just know. They're self-evident. That all men are created equal. I'm thinking, uh, yeah, no doubt about it. We've been given these unable rights. One of them is to be able to live. Ah, uh, yeah. So what we do less than 200 years later, we come along and we say, I tell you what, some woman doesn't like that fetus in her womb. We'll rip him out. Throw him away. Say, what? You're going to do what? You're going to rip? A human being from a mother's womb? You want to talk about shedding innocent blood. It's, it is the most horrendous, low down, sorry, Mississippi. When you were a little speck inside your mother's womb. It was you. And look, when you got the size of my little finger like this, you know it was you. When they got the size of my thumb, my fist, then seven or eight pounds in nine months or so. Come on, it was you all the way? Now, wasn't it? Somebody comes in there and tears you out there a piece at a time. You wouldn't be here tonight. What kind of mind would say, it's really not anybody in there? Should have listened to God and Thomas Jefferson. You have a God-given right to live. We're going to pay for that. The right to live, to be free, and the third one, and to pursue Happiness, hey, Mississippi, you know what makes me happy? To blow a mile of Drake's head smooth off at about 10 feet. Somebody said, blow a, shoot a poor little duck in the head. We got people running around the United States now. I said, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You shouldn't uh, kill any kind of meat and then consume that. You're like, what? Look. If you're visiting from PETA tonight, one, we love you, and two, I'm just warming up, and do we have a story for you? I notice they take their best-looking ones, and they strip them naked, 
in broad daylight, young lady, 20 years old, disrobes, totally naked, standing on a street corner in a major city, people driving by, has a sign out in front of Kentucky Fried Chicken, don't eat chicken. Mississippi, I don't get the getting naked part. All right, you don't want me to eat fried chicken. But to strip naked and dishonor your body. You say, what kind of mind does that? They get it in their head that there is no God. They claim to be wise but they become fools. And they bow down to birds, animals, reptiles, and each other. They worship and serve created things. Birds of the air. Instead of the creator, who's to be forever praised. That's the way it was in the Roman Empire. You know what, Mississippi? Things have, haven't changed a bit. Therefore, God gave them over to the degrading of their bodies to sexual immorality with each other. Any sexual immorality going on in the United States, Mississippi? What are you talking about? And it went from, goes from there, it escalates into sexual perversion. Men sleeping with men, committing indecent acts with them. Women with women. They receive in themselves the due penalty for their perversion, the Apostle Paul wrote. You say, what in the world happened to us? We forgot what our forefathers said. More on that later. I wonder what God says about shooting ducks. Because I fixed the blow of the duck calls and the idea of Mississippi is to get them in within gunshot range. Kill them and eat them. Well, I wouldn't want to violate the law, and I'm not talking about the law men have. I don't want to violate anything God has said. So here's a quote. It was about noon the day as they were continuing on their journey and approaching the city. Peter went upon the roof to pray. He became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. As he was praying, he fell into a trance. He saw what seemed to be a large sheet being let down by its four corners out of heaven. Now, you see this little screen here? That'd be a small one. This is a giant movie screen being let down out of the heavens, and Peter is standing there. He's looking at it. He was hungry. He wanted something to eat while the meal was being prepared. He falls into this trance. And he looks at this big movie screen. He's thinking, we got a message coming here. We got something coming out of heaven here. And it's directed at me. Here's old Peter, a Jew. Been under strict food laws for 1,500 years. And here comes a movie screen out of heaven. Uh, the movie screen on it. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals. Well, let's add it up now, Mississippi. Name the four-footers. Let's see. White-tailed deer. That's a four-footer. Bear, four-footer. Moose, four-footer. And what scared old Peter, hogs, they got four feet too, don't they? Old Peter's thinking, whoa now. Rabbit, four-footer. Squirrel, coon. The sheet also contained birds of the air. Now we're talking ducks. He's a bird of the air, right, Mississippi? Quail, doves, they're on it. And it contained creeping things like alligators, bullfrogs, and such. Crawfish, probably. I don't know who the first man was that walked up and looked down at a crawfish hole, that crawfish looking at him. I don't know who it was that said, you know, that looks like that'd be good to eat. 
But if you just looked at one of them, you'd think, whoo. But I know this. We got four-footed animals, birds of the air, creeping things. And a voice from heaven said, get up, kill and eat. Now, Mississippi, I'd be a C-plus man. C-plus in junior high, C-plus in high school, C-plus in college. Somebody says, you're saying that like you're kind of proud of that. I was smarter than half of them. It's not a bad place to be. But as a C-plus man, I just quoted you Acts chapter 10, about 9, 10 and following, that says, if you want to exegete it properly, that we got orders from headquarters that says, if it walks, crawls, flies, or swims, whack them and stack them. Right? Therefore, some lady comes along and says, I don't think it's right to kill animals based on what? Uh, Constitution of the United States. Let's start with that. Based on that, it doesn't forbid the killing of animals and consuming them. Uh, no, the Constitution doesn't forbid it. Uh, Declaration of Independence, no. The Bible, no. Any precedent in the court system, no. Lady, Keep your clothes on. I got to have my fried chicken. Or anything else that walks, crawls, flies, and swims, because I got orders from headquarters. First thing we do when we get in a duck blind, since we now know that killing ducks is sanctioned. I don't own a watch, but somebody better have one, because we can't fire a shot until 30 minutes before the sun comes up, ladies. You say, you mean when y'all duck hunt, you cannot make the mistake of firing a shot 30 minutes exactly before that sun comes up. So you better find out what time that is. You, so you look at these solar tables and you say, okay, in the morning, it's 631 legal shooting hours. We get in the blind and I'll say, I'll pour myself a cup of coffee. What about it? One of my sons will say, six minutes. I'll wait, drink my coffee. What about it? Two minutes. I just sit there. I'm making sure I'm legal before I do what I'm fixed to show y'all. Because if you do this before legal shooting hours, these ducks are coming there. Why tempt yourself? First thing I do is this. Not doing that loud. <laughs> There's the teal drake, the whistle. Beep, beep. That's all a teal drake can do. Green winged teal drake. And there's a little hen. <laughs> if teal hear that off in the distance, look. I'll hear one sometime go, kee, 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 kee. answer me, we over there. But get that gun. Bring it in, bring it in close. Look, you'll be sitting there, beep, 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 and you'll hear, <laughs> you just look up. It's 30 minutes before the sun comes up, 29 now, and look, they just come out of nowhere and they hit that water right there next to them decoys. You barely can make them out. They're like shadows on the water. You can't really make them out much at all. But you hear them, beep, 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 beep. You know they're teal. They were small, just dart in there. It'd be early. The last thing you want to do here in Mississippi is get sporty. Because if you make the mistake of jumping up saying, hey, ducks, to scare them up so that you can shoot them in the air, the problem is when they get up, that backdrop back in there behind you, that tree line, they get up off that water at daylight, they just disappear. They just gone. You won't kill any of them, maybe one. Here's some good sound advice from the old duck man. Just ground swat them and get it over with. <laughs> Somebody say, wait a minute. I cannot believe a man of your reputation and stature would stoop so low as to shoot a poor bunch of little teal ducks swimming on the water. Oh, you misunderstood me. I'll wait till they stop swimming. 
You'll get more of them if you'll wait till they stop and kind of ball up and everybody together. We used to have to count one, two, three, but now I just reach and come up and now all my sons and everybody else, cousins, they all come up and nobody says anything. We just raise up. Boom, 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 boom. I got a dog going to go out there and start bringing them back. I can't tell what they got. It's too early. The dog finally stops, swims around out there. I said, boys, we got nine out of that bunch. We starting out good. Mississippi, I've never had anyone walk up, take the lid off the pot, and look at the ducks that's cooking. I've never had a person say, I wonder if they were sitting or flying when they shot them. <laughs> the Almighty said, kill them and eat them. That's exactly what we're going to do. So don't worry about it. They're nothing better than a good ground spot. It's be a widgeon. Relix. Hit the second one. Take your finger. In Louisiana, we all have a little piece of meat hanging down in the back of our throat. It's round. Y'all check. I think you ought to have one, Mississippi. You look, and you see a little piece of meat. Well, the first time I saw that by hanging back there, I said, what in the world is that? I said, why would the Almighty put that little old round piece of meat? Here's a news flash. If you didn't have that, you couldn't sound like a pintail. So God gave you that so you can sound like a pintail duck. That's what it's doing there. So you go, by the way, if you didn't have it, it'd be this. That's heavy equipment backing up. That don't call nothing. Pintail, you've got to break that. So you go, I'm breaking into. So that gives you pintail, teal, widgeon, and teal hen. You got the old gadwall. Gray duck, we call them in Louisiana. Blow it one lick. Wait about, wait about four seconds. Or someone's calling with a hen call. You just, you mix that in with your hen call. My son came up with that. It's great on gadwalls. The old Mallard Drake, it's a whistle that I'm, Breathing a bass note real low. I'm going. Uh, I figured out that if you hummed a bass note into that pintail widgeon whistle I built with a stem and put it in a little housing, I figured out you'd have a perfect mile of Drake. Do you realize that no one in the world had ever thought of that? No one. So I thought about it. <clears throat> Figured it out. I sent that off and got a patent. U.S. Department of Trade, Commerce in Washington, D.C., Mississippi. I was the only one that had one. And the only way you could get one is contact me for a nominal fee, and I'd give you one. That's when things started looking better. You have to... You hum a bass note. Times are hard. The old Woody. If he's flying, that's what he does. But you want to be sitting, because, see, if you're blowing a flying call out of flying Woody, everybody flying, nobody knows where to come back to. So if he be flying, you got to be sitting. So you hear him, beep, beep, he's coming across the top of the timber. That's when they're sitting. So as you old Woody, when times are hard, you get out there in the thicket, and you hear him out there. He's up there. You get down in the brush. Get that gun barrel stuck through there. Ready to go. 
And look, you give them that sit and call, and look, you shake the water a little bit. You give them that sit and call. They'll answer you. You answer them back. Shake the water with your hand. Shake the water a little bit. Get you some ripples coming out of there. Get you some ripples. Make you plenty of racket. But every five to ten seconds, shake the water. Blow that sit and call. They'll answer you. Look, you'll look up directly, and they'll just swim single file coming through them trees. Now, y'all do what you want to. I said times were hard. <clears throat> as far as the mallard hens, <laughs> you've got those kind. You've got like, uh, I use this one all the time. Where is that old duck picker? By the way, we named this duck call after all the fine women of the United States of America who pick their men's ducks when they bring them in. I said, let's name one of our duck calls duck picker. And all these guys nationwide, you got to remember, this is about the 10th speech of about a loop of about 27 cities, some of them up in New York State, Pennsylvania. So I get up north, and I ask them girls, up there, do y'all pick your men's ducks? And I said, no. <laughs> so here's what I've concluded. See, I married Miss Kay. She'd be 16. You marry them at 16, they'll pick your ducks. <laughs> the problem with a lot of people is they're waiting to get to be 20 years old before they marry them. That's way too old. Here's the deal. You wait till a woman gets to be 20 and marry her, I tell you what's going to get picked. Your pocket. <laughs> I'm just giving you a little river rat counseling here tonight. Trying to help you out. Check with mom and dad before you marry her. You can't go wrong with a young one. Me and Miss Kay. I look back at it now. But here we are, 45 years later. What a woman, great woman, great cook, great mother, and she's picked a many a duck. <laughs> this is a little finisher. <laughs> we use that in the timber all the time. Some are raspy. Some are smooth, some are loud, some are soft. It's the duck part of me. I recommend, and I think you desperately need it, and so does our country and our world. I recommend you love God, love your neighbor, and shoot ducks in that order. That's me. You say, how did you ever end up going around the United States of America talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I was at a place one time, I think it was the Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana. They said, will you give us a duck call seminar? I said, yes, sir. They said, you'll be standing under that big sign that said Budweiser, King of Beers. I said, okay. I walked over there. This is about 12, 15 years ago. I stood on that sign. I gave him the duck call deal like you just heard. And I looked out there and I said, all these people. I said, I got to tell them. Love your neighbor. To walk away without them knowing what I'm fixed to tell you. I said, I got to tell them. So I did. I told them, I said, I think I'm going to preach you a little sermon. And I'm not actually a preacher. And there was a hush that fell over the crowd. You could have heard a pin drop. And I told them what I'm fixed to tell you. After all the smoke cleared, some fellows came up and they said, that took some gall. I said, no, you have to love them more than you fear them. And that's what I did. I loved them enough to tell them. They said, would you come to our church and do that? I said, call Miss Kay. Well, I never dreamed that that was going nationwide. <laughs> like that. I thought, well. I know what you can do, and the Almighty will put you on the road for sure. 
Tell them the good news about Jesus. And man, look out because the crowds get bigger and bigger. The success of our new nation does not depend on, does not depend on the power of government. Far from it. The success of our new nation depends on the ability of each of ourselves to govern ourselves according to the moral principles of the Ten Commandments. James Madison, writer of the Federalist Papers, President number four, I think, say what? You mean if we strive to live as a nation by the Ten Commandments, we'll have a great successful nation? That's it? He said, that's it. That's what you do. Mississippi, look around. Will they steal anything that ain't tied down or what? Is there some thieving going on in Mississippi? You talk about steal. Thou shalt not steal. They don't even pay it any mind anymore. The atheist goes into the courthouse in Alabama and he sees the Ten Commandments in the, in the rotunda there when you walk in, the foyer. He sees the Ten Commandments etched in stone. He said, it's a violation of my rights. It's been seven or eight years ago. Violation of my rights. You know what they did, Mississippi? They hauled them out of there. I'm like, you took the Ten Commandments out of a courthouse? Our Supreme Court, when they're seated, right behind them there's a big mural. God given Moses the Ten Commandments. It's within ten feet of them. These big doors when you walk in the Supreme Court chambers, that's the law being given at Sinai. But they hauled it out of the courthouse in Alabama. Told old Judge Roy Moore, no can do. I'll just give you number five. Children, honor your father and mother. Mississippi, when your children dishonor when they dishonor their father and mother they drive too fast they smoke dope they go down and tear up people's property i notice when they dishonor their parents and the laws catch them <clears throat> you know where they end up courthouse juvenile court right yeah uh number six don't murder mississippi you want to violate number six the laws catch you. You trust me. You're going to end up at the courthouse as surely as I'm standing here. Right? That's what they do with murderers. They have a court date. Uh, don't commit adultery. Gentlemen, if your woman catches you committing adultery with another woman, there's a good possibility you could have a court date before it's all over. Happens all the time. About half the time it happens. You say, Probably uh, we'll go down there and divide it all up. Yep. Kids will cry. Yep. Some of you have been through it. Yep. Violated commandment number six. Number seven. <clears throat> uh, don't steal. You rob a bank. The laws catch you. You're going to have to settle at the courthouse before it's over. Burglarize someone's home. <clears throat> Your courthouse bound when they catch you. Uh, don't lie. What did they do with Martha Stewart when she told that little lie to the feds over a little stock deal? Where'd she end up, Mississippi? Courthouse. We don't care if you got $50 billion, Martha. You lied to us, honey. And look, we get you down in that courthouse. You better not lie when you get on that stand. That's perjury. That's really lying. And don't covet. Now, I just gave you five or six of them. That you're sure to end up at the courthouse. 
Mississippi. If you're going to end up at the courthouse anyway for violating most of the Ten Commandments, that might be a pretty good place to put them. What do you think? I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, Martha, you lied to us. So guess what? You're going to the courthouse where we, where we took the commandments out of it because we didn't want to look on them. But since you lied to us, we got to take you to the courthouse, put you in the courtroom, and tell you you better not lie. You better swear by something. Don't be lying to us because you already told one. That got you down here at the courthouse. So what is it, Mississippi? We don't want Martha to walk by and see at in stone. Thou shalt not lie. I mean, I don't think it would hurt her. What do you think? In fact, cut it any way you want to cut it. It's a great code. Think about it. Just take stealing. Let's just quit. Let's all just quit stealing in Mississippi. Would you have a better state? I mean, you say, what in the world happened to all that money up there on Wall Street? What happened to the money? A bunch of thieves. They steal. That's where it goes. Where in the world is all that money going in Washington, D.C.? Thievery. Stealing. You think it goes all the way to Washington, uh, Mississippi? Really, do you believe that it goes all the way to Mississippi? Why, sure. You say, what if everyone quits stealing? Well, there goes all your burglar alarm systems, all your, uh, you know, all these video cameras. You don't have to fool with that anymore. Everybody's just going to quit on their own. Would it be? Don't have to lock your truck. Nah. For what? Where we live, we don't lock our trucks. We don't lock our house. We lock nothing. You say, well, you don't have any thieving? No, see, the first line of defense are these terriers of Miss K's. You got these dogs you got to get by. If you get by them and you're still in one piece, well, then there I am, you know, with these AR-15s, you know, double clips, you know, just I got enough firepower that say, is that boy ever going to run out of ammo? It's not one of the places you want to go to rob. Plus, most people, I'm sitting in my rig, they come up here and say, let's knock him off. And they probably look, I'll look up at them. They say, tell you what, let's get on down just a little further. <laughs> Good night. I don't know whether they want to rob him or not. But isn't it a sorry, sad state that you put something down, it's just gone. Well, we're all laughing about how wicked the place is. How have you done with the Ten Commandments? You know what the sad part is? I haven't even come close to keeping the Ten Commandments. And look, I just mentioned about six of the ten. Stealing, lying, coveting, adultery, murder, dishonoring my parents. That's all I mentioned. There's 600. Jealousy, fits of rage, gossip, hatred, envy. You're like, ooh, factions, witchcraft. You're like, what in the world? You know what the bottom line is? See, I'm telling you about the law. You say, how many human beings are under law? Everyone outside of Jesus on planet Earth are under that code of conduct. You know what the law demands, the law of Moses? You know what it demands? The law that God gave Moses at Sinai. You know what its demands are, Mississippi? 100% flawless obedience. No provision for mistakes. None. You say, well, why did all these animals get slaughtered for 1,500 years? 
just to let everybody know and remind them, guilty, 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 all of you. Everyone who sins breaks the law. I just gave you about 10 of them and you have you done? Let's see. Have I ever been commode hugging drunk? Are you kidding? You say, you've been in moral field? Yup. You say, did you kill too many ducks? Yeah. You say, well, good night. The old apostle Paul before me, murderer. You see, it doesn't make any difference if you've been a prostitute or just told a few white lies or if you were a homosexual, any of those things. You say, everybody breaks the law. Anybody in here that's 100% totally perfect? As far as your works are concerned, I don't think so. That's where everybody is. And since I don't know anybody from New Albany, Mississippi, that's where you are. If you don't get in on what I'm fixed to tell you about, I'm giving you the bad news first. Just one little bit of it. Everybody makes mistakes and nobody's perfect. All have sinned. Fallen short. True, God, count me as one of them. Number two, not but two, everybody sins. This is the bad news. Cut off from God as soon as you commit that first sin. You say, how was I when I came from my mother? You were wonderful. No sin then. You know why? You didn't know what lying was or stealing or adultery or coveting or fits of rage. You might have been crying when you were about, Eight pounds right out of your mother's womb. But all you wanted to be, it was be fed. Right? Little baby. The law didn't have any effect on you. However, you started to be a little taller and you got on up in years. And uh-oh, there came a time in your life when you knew what was right and what was wrong, even if you never had a Bible. You say, what about the Sioux Indians who never heard of Jesus and never had a Bible? What about the far-off tribes in the Amazon jungle? How could God say to every one of them, sinners, sinners, lawbreakers? You know why? Because when they stole from each other, when they stole from each other, this tribe steals from that tribe. If they didn't know anything was wrong with it, why are they slipping up there in the dead of night to do their stealing? Why are you being so sneaky if you want to go steal that tribe's horses? Who told you there was something wrong with it? How do you know they're going to get mad for you stealing their horses? Because everybody knew what stealing was, didn't they? They never read it, thou shalt not steal. God said, I put it in their hearts to know what it is. You reckon all the Indians running around knew who their woman was? Yeah, they knew who their woman was because you messed with their woman, and then we got, we got a fight here, and then somebody is killed over that woman. See how it works? Everybody knows. Therefore, we know that whatever the law says, it says to the whole world. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be justified by the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. He wrote it down in stone so we all know what it is. We can read it, but guess what we did? Violated it anyway. Nothing wrong with the law, but there's a lot wrong with us. We're the problem. Number two, physical death is your second problem. You say physical death? Heart attack, cancer. Car wreck, lightning, gunshot, trip. A tree just falls on you. Happens all the time. You're like drowning. You're like 
How many ways are there for us to physically die? It's a list from here to Monroe, Louisiana. How are you going to fix it? You know any way out of that? It's going to happen to everyone in this room, including me. We've all sinned, and I guarantee you, and you know it to be true. You say, he ain't lying. And number two is you're going to die physically. Well, if you die physically, Mississippi, and you're already dead in your sins, your fate sealed forever and ever and ever and ever. So your life's in shambles because of the sins that you committed, and physical death comes your way, and you're standing there trying to explain to God why you ended up like you ended up. Well, I'm removing that excuse from you here tonight. It's not that you're not going to know now. You're going to know the way out, the solution to your sin problem and your physical death problem, your grave problem, your casket problem. I'll start with this. Now we're on the good news. It won't take long, and I'll shut up and go back to Louisiana. Uh, what year is it, Mississippi? 2010 years. That meant last year was 2009. The year before was 2008. The year before was 2007. Let's walk it back. Because it had to be a one. Since it's 2010 years, there had to be a one. Two, three, four, five, right? Well, evidently something rather large happened 2010 years ago, or we wouldn't all be saying it's 2010 years since it happened. I want to know what happened 2010 years ago that we're all saying, okay, uh, what's the date? <clears throat> well, that'd be uh, March, uh, whatever, 18, 19, 20, uh, 2010 years. There's a little A and a D after that. 2010 A-D. Anno Domini. You say, what does that mean? Year of our Lord. Now, wait a minute. All these atheists are signing their checkbooks, and they write down there, March the 20th, 2010 years since Jesus got here. I said, wait a minute. I thought you didn't believe in Jesus. Well, I don't believe in him. I said, well, you're counting time by him like all the rest of us. If you're counting time by him, he's bound to have been here. Now, look. You say, we're counting time by Jesus when he got here. Yeah. You say, what would you have had to do that the rest of the world, for the most part, a lot of them, you know, well, I'll tell you what, we just can't, we can't say that. These college professors, we, we got to call it something else. We just can't go with that. What are we going to call it? Uh, let's call it uh, 2010 CE. You say, Bill, what is that? We'll call it common era. Common era. Everybody since Constantine has been counting. That's about 250, 300. Been counting time by Jesus of Galilee. I figure for good reason. I know this, Mississippi. He was here. Or we wouldn't be saying it's 2010 years since he got here, would we? He was here. You said, why'd he come? You'll know the truth about Jesus. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, one thing I've already told you that's got you by the throat, the law, got you. You say, if you broke it, yeah, it killed you. That's why the law of Moses is called the law of sin and death. You say, I violate that thing. I'm a dead man. I'm a walking, talking, dead person. Yeah. Jesus came down to set you free from that, put you under another system. It's called grace. Therefore, you say, oh, what is grace to man? Trust God and try. And when you blow it again, it's removed, not counted against you. And it's free. You say, you mean every rotten, filthy thing I've ever done can be removed by Jesus? Because look, what did he do when he got to the earth? What did he say the price would be in order to get you with all your sins removed and none ever counted against you. You know what the price was? His blood for your sins. 
That's why God became, do you think God, the creator of the cosmos, he created the cosmos through Jesus. You say, was Jesus there when it all started? Yeah. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh. You say, God become a human being so they could get their hands on him. Yeah. How are you going to crucify a God that breathed a cosmos into being? You're not going to touch him unless he allows you to. So he sent Jesus in a human body built just like you in every way. Jesus took a cross to remove all your sins, blood for your violations. My life, God says, for yours. You want in on that? Well, I was 28 when I heard it. I said, all my rotten, filthy sins taken away. Lord, Lord. Yep. I said, what about that grave? How long did Jesus, God in flesh, stay in that tomb before he came out of that tomb? Three days. You say, why in three days' time would God raise Jesus from the earth? Mississippi. If God removed your sins, what good would it do if he couldn't raise you from the ground? It wouldn't do you any good. Why follow Jesus if he can't get you out of that hole? You say, why do you follow Jesus, Phil Robinson? Because of the resurrection of the dead. That's why. You say, it's the resurrection that you're standing on here. Yeah. Everybody told me, oh, the cross of Christ. I um, appreciate it greatly. But to me, the resurrection was proof that he had the power to remove my sin. You say, we're talking about dead men coming from the ground here. They told me years ago, son, you get up there and you blow them duck call, but you get to wave in a Bible around. They said, don't you fear that that's going to hurt your business? I said, hurt my business? We're talking about the resurrection, the energizing of dead flesh and bringing it out of the ground. I said, I've got to tell them about that. Not only did it not hurt my business, Mississippi, my business went out the roof. God blesses those who do right. So Jesus came. We're counting time by him. He died on the cross to take away all your sins. You say, you mean every rotten thing I've ever done? Yup. All gone? Yup. Will he remember them anymore? No. Removes them? Forgets them. You say, what about any sin I commit in the future? Jesus died, was buried, raised from the dead. That's the good news. Forty days he spent on the earth to prove he was alive. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bone, as you see I have. He had flesh, bone, a glorified human body. That's where you'll be. We don't yet know what we'll be, but we know when he appears, we'll be like him. You say, what was one of the things he could do? Well, he went through walls, just went through walls. Yeah, whoa. He appeared to the disciples. Another thing he did is he went back into heaven where he came from without a rocket booster. You say, that is getting out of Dodge. There's some kind of power going on there. Uh, you humans want in on this action or what? See, y'all, I'm coming back in the same way I'm going. These angels are telling you. I'll be back. Realistically, what chance do you have unless there's divine intervention? See, I've heard them tell me, well, Phil, I think I'll take my chance without Jesus. I say, what chance is that? You're going six feet deep? Uh, yeah. So then what? If there's not divine intervention, Mississippi, we're never coming out of that ground. You say, we got one shot here, and I've just told you what it is. You say, uh, I'm going to have to double check you on that. I'll welcome you to double check me on that. You're a sinner and you're going to die one day. Jesus came to die, was buried and raised from the dead to solve your problems for your charge. You say, and the blood of Jesus where Jesus is now constantly cleanses me from any sin that I will ever commit while I'm on planet Earth. Do you think people become Christians and just stop sinning? Look, I quit being immoral. I quit getting drunk. You say, but have you sinned as a Christian? Yeah. Try not to. You say, what's the difference between that and law? Now I have one Jesus, my Lord, to speak to the Father on my behalf. Takes away all my sins. Any sin. 
You say, past ones removed, no future ones counted against you. You got it. Guaranteed to be raised from the dead. You got it. Given the Holy Spirit to help you while you're here. You got it. The Bible to guide your ways. Yeah. You say, what do I do to get in on that? I've told you the message. I'm a messenger. You say, how do I get in on that message? Got to believe it. I can't help you there. I am the messenger. Faith comes from hearing the message. I'm just your messenger. I would never condemn you. I would never judge you. Not my job. I just give you the message. It's up to you whether you accept it by faith or not. Well, uh, can you scientifically prove that uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? No. My college professor said a large explosion got it here. If God put it here and they're wrong, they're going to get in a big bind. If there is no God, everybody loses and nobody's ever coming out of the ground. You can't win if there's no God. So therefore, I've said, well, let's see. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'll accept that by faith. I know this. Can you scientifically disprove that's what happened? You say, oh, no. It's the only chance we got. Faith. You're going to have to repent like everybody else. You say, uh, smoking dope, that's out. Uh, getting drunk, that's the end of that. Uh, right now, I'm shacked up. What do you recommend? Sign the dotted line. You'll be unshacked. You'll be married. You say, what? Well, got that one fixed. Didn't take long either. A lot cheaper to get in in marriages than it is to get out of them. Make Jesus Lord of your life. And finally, look, I'm just a man. C plus man. I never read a word from Genesis all the way to Jesus coming. Not a word about water baptism. So you say, I believe the message I've heard tonight. I'm making a decision to repent of my sins. I tell you what, Jesus, you'll be the Lord of my life from now on because the evil one has been ruling me my entire life. You renounce the evil one, and the power of God trounces him, gives you his Holy Spirit instead of that evil spirit, the evil one, and you say, I'm marked forevermore. Yep. You say, when does that occur? I never read a word about water baptism till Jesus showed up. And I've already told you that the fella appointed to pave the way for the Savior of the world became famous for one thing. I never read about it until he showed up. Jesus and the one paving the way for him. His name was John the what? That's interesting. Never read a word about it till God becomes flesh. And the fellow who paved in the way for the Savior of the world becomes famous for baptizing people in water. Uh, about what a third of you doing these miracles, they asked Jesus. Jesus said, John's baptism, was it from heaven or men? They said, we can't say from heaven because he's going to say, why didn't you let him baptize you? And we can't say from men because all these people that John is baptizing, they think he is from God, which he was. They said, we don't know where it came from, water baptism. We don't know where it come from. He said, I'm not going to tell you by what authority I'm doing these miracles either. You said, what's the point? They wouldn't believe John. He couldn't say anything to him. They rejected God's purpose for themselves because they wouldn't let John baptize them. Jesus post-resurrection standing in a glorified body. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go make disciples of all nations and you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Duh. You say, so when people say, I want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, I believe the gospel, what do you do with them? If we're in one of them duck blinds, I say, come out of them waiters. You want to receive Jesus as Lord? Yeah, I do. I said, get out of them waiters like you came from your mama because you're going to need some dry clothes. I'm going to knock them decoys out of the way, and we're going to get it on like a chicken bone. 
And some of them say, well, good night. That's pretty cold out there. It's 30 degrees. I said, hey, Jack, they didn't have heated baptisms in the first century. Suck it up. Who's a man? I walk out there usually with my waders on. No use in both of us getting wet. I've already been baptized. Down they go in the Washtar River, and they leave their rejoicing, put their dry clothes back on. We turn the heater up a little bit, a little charcoal bucket. And everybody's happy, and they write me letters years later saying, what can I ever do to thank you? I said, hey, just doing my duty, my man. I love you. Don't forget that. What part of uh, go make disciples and baptize them are we not getting in the 21st century? Come on, Mississippi. Check every conversion story in the book of Acts while you're at it. What did they do when they heard the message? What did they do? Tell it. Where'd they take them? What'd they do with them when they? Why, well, sure. I mean, duh. So people in the America say, well, you know, I don't know whether. Let's do what? Too simple to miss. I love you. And if you're not in Jesus, don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just like he was raised from the dead through the glory of the father we too may live a life a new life you die to sin you're buried with Jesus and you're resurrected with him come on simple 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 it's on about a fifth or sixth grade level for the ones of you not who've not done that you say I need to move on that you say what'd be wrong with going over here on Sardis tonight nothing I'll drive you by that little first little river we got down to I'll drive you down and I'll do it for you if you're scared you say you mean on your way back to Louisiana yeah a fellow wrote me the other day from North Carolina he said Mr. Robinson I heard you speak over in North Carolina yeah he said listen he told me something, he'd been with some group, whatever. He said, you don't have to come to me. I'm coming to you. He said, I'm coming from North Carolina, if you'll allow me to, all the way to the mouth of Cypress Creek in Louisiana, if you'll take me out there in that river and baptize me. I told my wife, I said, tell me, come on. You said, how many have done that? A throng. More than I could count. Don't forget that, Mississippi. You do that. Put your faith in Jesus. Bear that old man, that new one's come forth, sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Look, your individual life would be way better. I've been on both sides of this thing. 28 years, no Jesus. Woo, this second half has been better. Way better. Look, your individual life would be better. Your little community, the neighborhood you live in, would be way better when they all follow Jesus. You trying to tell me, New Albany wouldn't be better. Everybody follow Jesus. How about Mississippi? How about the United States? How about the world? You know we'd be better off to do what our forefathers said. So let's all get on our feet and say, I'll tell you one thing. I've had enough of this stuff. I say, Jesus, number one, we love God. This is all required of you. Love God, love your neighbor, shoot your ducks and your deer and catch your fish. Got it? Father, I pray for anyone here that might not have ever met Jesus until tonight. Father, I pray that you would open their heart, that talk to these brothers here, talk to these preachers here, and get it on right for the first time in their life. Father, I pray that they would accept the message through faith, put that old person to death, Bring that new one up with the help of God. Father, I pray that they receive your spirit. I pray that they move on what they've heard, the message. Father, without divine intervention, as the Apostle Paul said, we are to be pitied, pitied if there's no resurrection of the dead. So, Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed to remove all of our sins. And we are really thankful, Father, for that mighty resurrection that guarantees, gives us hope to live beyond that grave. Father, for all our loved ones who've gone on before us, 
we are thankful for that they're not lying there without hope. They've just simply fallen asleep. No time has passed for them. And they're just waiting on Resurrection Day. Thank you, Father, for giving that hope to us through Jesus. So I pray that if there's anyone here tonight, Father, that they'll come forward. I'll be happy to pray with them, Father, as one of your servants. And I would hope, Father, that you would prick their hearts to do so. It's through Jesus who made all this possible with the help of your spirit, Father, who lives in me, that I ask this prayer on behalf of these good folks from Mississippi here tonight. Amen. I'm done.